Hopefully you're in the right spot. How many of you are here for wireless security? Everybody's awake. All right, we'll, we'll play that same game in just a minute here, and we'll see how many people I put to sleep. Um, are we good to go? I know we're a couple of minutes early. Should we wait? That clock is actually still at Okay, so we, we are on time. One minute. One minute. Okay, we'll wait one more minute. Come on in. If you're in the doorway, come find a seat over here so you can see. How many of you are having trouble with the wireless today? You got your pineapple in this. That's great. <laughs> I mean, that's terrible. Okay, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. In the back? All right, uh, my name is Seth Johnson. I work for a company called Bluehost. You may have heard of them. They're a local company and a sponsor of Open West. Um, and if you happen to work for Bluehost and have seen me give this talk before, it's probably about the same because the information is still true. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about St. Con. Uh, it's a security conference held here in the state of Utah. It will be held uh, at Weber State October 27th through the 30th. It's a day right before Halloween. Um, it's a great security con if you haven't been, but you like security. It's awesome and you should totally go. Uh, thank you. So uh, next thing I want to talk about, my little disclaimer here. I'm not responsible for anything you do with this information. <laughs> I am teaching you how wireless works and how current exploits are being used. I expect you to be responsible citizens of the United States of America and Utah. If you live in Utah, I guess if you live in other states, there are probably other codes for that. But uh, these codes indicate that misuse of the things I'm about to teach you uh, will make you a criminal. And I disclaim any responsibility for this. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is how wireless networks work. Uh, wireless networks use over-the-air radio transmissions. They're uh, actually um, radiation of signals using radio waves. And there are two different kinds of antennas that we use. Uh, actually, I brought my ham radio today. You guys may have seen this around with some of the people working here at Open West. How many of you are ham radio operators? Bunch of you. How many of you know what kind of antenna I have on here? Okay. Is this a directional or omnidirectional antenna? This is an omnidirectional antenna. It receives signals and sends signals in almost every direction. And it turns out that um, the shape of the signal for this ends up being in kind of a donut shape from where the antenna is. Um, you'll see a little bit of, so I don't have to walk in front of that, a little bit of disbursement that looks kind of like that. Uh, and it generally ends up going out in kind of a sideways direction. So you'll also notice for the people who are using your radios, if you're trying to go between floors with all the concrete that's in here, it doesn't work very well. Uh, and that's just kind of the nature of how radio waves work. They also bounce off, off of a lot of different things. And almost all of the technology that we use today for wireless is based on radio waves. Even Bluetooth uses the same kind of thing. All right, so uh, a couple of different standards that we have in wireless. Uh, the frequency bands that are allowed for wireless are the 2.4, the 3.6, the 5, and the 60 gigahertz. And those were established in 1947 and again in 1985. And chances are you use either the 2.4 or the 5 gigahertz band and I don't know of anything that I've seen at least commercially available that uses 3.6 or 60 gigahertz for consumer kinds of things. There are a bunch of different specifications for wireless networking for computers. You've got A which was the first one that was commercialized and then B which was better and had a little bit longer range and then G kind of implemented a little bit of both B and A for greater speed. Then N was a huge jump in speed, and then AC is another huge jump in speed, and there are a bunch of other things coming out soon that hopefully will make that even faster, because who likes fast wireless? Yeah. 
I do. I think it's great. Uh, <clears throat> the people who designed these kinds of things realized that we also have a great need for security. It turns out that all the things that we transmit on these wireless networks, like every other computer network, are things that we generally want to keep secure and safe from prying eyes. So uh, one of the things that they did in 2001 was they instituted WEP, which was supposed to be the wired equivalent privacy. Uh, WEP is not very good, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, then a couple of years later, they figured they would do something to solve some of the problems with that and introduce it WPA in 2003. And then in 2004, they fixed some more problems in the WPA2. And then in 2011, they introduced new problems by giving you WPS. <laughs> and we're going to talk about each one of those things here. Uh, so WP has a key of 10 or 26 hex digits. And you usually enter them as 5 to 13, and it just doubles it. Which, how many of you think that's a great idea? No one thinks that's a great idea. That basically says that your passcode to get into the network is five characters long. And I think with all the things that we've learned in recent years, that five characters is definitely not enough for a passcode. Uh, then it converts it into an ASCII byte value, and it uses a 24-bit initialization vector, and uses the RC4 stream cipher to encode it, then XORs it with plain text. The, initializ excuse me, the initialization vector collision probability is at 50% per 5,000 packets. Now, for those of you who don't know a lot about cryptography, this is horrible. Uh, cryptography, I think we already just had a talk by Robert uh, about cryptography and the AES cipher. Uh, collisions are absolutely the worst thing that you can have as far as cryptography is concerned. Because when you have two things that give you the same value, they're both valid. You don't want collisions. Uh, how many of you have heard of a cipher call, or I guess a hashing mechanism called MD5? How many of you know why that's not a great thing to be using anymore? Collisions. Collisions, right? You can take two things, MD5, both of those things, and get the same value back. Uh, I think last year at St. Con, one of the challenges for the Hackers Challenge that I built was a set of files that had MD5 collisions. If you run the MD5 on these two files, they return the same value, but when you run the executable, they do totally different things. Uh, those kinds of things are very dangerous, and RC4 is actually worse than MD5 uh, for the reasons that we've talked about here. What's that? Different things. MD5 and RCF are different things, so why do you say it's worse? You're comparing apples and oranges, right? Well, a absolutely. They're, they're not the same kind of thing. This is a stream cipher. Uh, but with that being said, the, the collision ratio is much higher on RC4. And that's why it's such a bad idea to be using RC4. Now, uh, we did a couple of experiments on web keys using a 104-bit web key with 40,000 packets captured. It takes about one minute and to capture the packets, about two seconds and five megabits of RAM, megabytes of RAM, and there's a 50% probability that you can extract the key. When you go to 60,000 packets, it's 80%, and with 80,000 packets, 95% probability that you can get the key for a web network. How many of you are running web at home right now? Don't. <laughs> Don't. Okay. If I can figure out with if I can figure out with a 95% probability in just a couple of minutes, 3 minutes, what your passcode is, that's probably not a great thing to be running. Now, I know that a lot of you will say I understand that this attack is based on the fact that you have to run traffic over the network. And running traffic over the network is what generates these packets. So if I don't run a whole lot of traffic over my network, then you're not going to be able to get that. That's great, except for I can generate these 80,000 packets myself. Uh, I don't know at what rate you have to get to to where you have a 100% probability of extracting the key, but there is a rate at which that happens. So it's not a great idea to be using WEP for your home networks. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think is interesting is that people still use it. A couple people in this room. Uh, this is a, an Android snapshot, and you've got 
this person using web, and this person using web, and this person using web, and this person using web. Uh, a lot of people are still running web, and there are better options out there even for older hardware, which we're going to talk about. Uh, WPA <coughs> introduced what we normally call TK or Temporal Key Integrity Protocol to the web kind of algorithm to give it a little bit uh, a better of a, a mixing function, and it added a sequence counter, and it increased the message integrity check to 64 bits, and it forced unique encryption keys, but it still uses the RC4 algorithm in identical hardware. There are good and bad things about this. Uh, the bad thing is that RC4 is still not a great algorithm as far as encryption goes, and the good thing is that you can use identical hardware. So anything that you are running right now that runs WEP can actually run WPA. If you are running WEP right now, go home and figure out how to update your device and put WPA on it. If you have the option to do WPA2, obviously you should do that, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Uh, WPA2 replaced TKIP with the counter cipher mode protocol and it uses AES based encryption. So those of you who were just in here for the AES encryption talk, you should know exactly how that works. It uses a 128-bit key, so mathematically speaking, 2 to the 64th changes to 2 to the n divided by 2, which is a lot bigger. Uh, it re does require the newer hardware because it doesn't use the RC4 algorithm anymore. You can use a pre-shared key or an authentication server. Both of them have benefits and drawbacks. Uh, the longer your key is, the better you are. And it also has the ability for you to use an EAP authentication framework, um, which also has its own benefits and drawbacks. Um, and then, because WPA2 was so secure, people whined because it was hard. So we introduced Wi-Fi. Excuse me, we introduced Wi-Fi protected setup. So it's trying to make it easier. You can use a pin or a button or near-field communication to automatically configure all of those things. The problem is that once you make it easy then it's easy for all the people to get into your network too. Um, it uses the EAP transactions and it operates outside of WPA2 to get you into WPA2. Uh, it has major security flaws that include leaking the pre-shared key that you use to get on your WPA2 network. Uh, and a lot of devices that were shipped with Wi-Fi protected setup don't have the ability to disable it. That's kind of a terrible thing because you should have the ability to protect your network. Um, I think that WPS is great for those moments when you want to hurry and turn it on and have your mom press the button because she doesn't know how to configure that or have your grandpa press the button to hook up his phone or something if they're going to be using the network at your house. That's great. But leaving it on long term is a risk because it can leak your pre-shared key in ways that the WPA2 doesn't protect you for because the WPS just says here's the key automatically. Uh, a number of devices have released software updates to allow you to disable WPS. Uh, if you are running a home wireless network, which I would assume almost everyone in this room is, go home and find out if WPA or WPS is running on your network. If it is, I would recommend that you turn it off and it will keep you safer. Uh, so, a couple of things that you need to know about wireless that we use every day. We have the service set identifier, which is the SSID, or the name of your network. Uh, how many of you connected to the Open West network today? There's an SSID, or the Wolverine Wi-Fi, or Wolverine Wi-Fi Secure, or something like that. The BSSID, or the basic service set identification, is the MAC address of the device that you're connecting to. And the extended service set is generally only used in more advanced environments, like here at the university, where there are a number of devices, a number of BSSIDs that are on the same SSID network, and so when you move from one place to another, you continue to have the same network functionality. You're not actually hitting the same access point, you hit a different access point, but everything else is kind of in, in a seamless operation as part of a, a mesh network. Uh, a lot of us use SSID broadcasts, that's what you see when you search for networks, and networks that you have not used before are already available. Uh, we generally use passwords on our wireless networks. We have preferred networks, 
that we have already stored. I would imagine that some of you have your home network stored so that you can open up your computer and connect automatically. And your saved connection settings, which also saves your password and things like that. Uh, how many of you have used some of these things? Yeah, everybody, right? This is the way wireless works. This is the everyday wireless that we're used to. So uh, let's talk a little bit about SSIDs. SSID broadcasts mean that you tell everyone what your network is named. Uh, the Wiggle.net group has released a list of the SSIDs of various networks across the world. And 6.5% of the SSIDs in the world end up being one of these things. How many of you have a wireless network named one of these things? That's really surprising. Good job, everyone. Uh, I would recommend that you don't use the default name for your wireless network. Uh, there are a couple of different reasons for that. One is, if you have a wireless network that's called Linksys, I can probably determine the make and model of your wireless device rather quickly. Uh, knowing information about someone's network gives you an advantage in attacking them. Uh, I guess no SSID is kind of fun, but Netgear tells you what you're running in D-Link and then default. And the, the majority of these things also tell you that the person running this network probably didn't change any of the other settings as well. Uh, I would recommend that you make sure that you don't use the default settings for your wireless router. The <laughs> default settings that are available for your wireless router weren't configured to make you secure. They were configured to make it easy for you to access so that the company that sold you that device doesn't have to provide a whole lot of support for it. Uh, in previous versions of this talk, I had someone suggest that maybe if you have a Netgear device, you should name it Linksys. That's kind of an interesting idea. Uh, I wouldn't say that's necessarily a bad idea. Additionally, it might be worth uh, disabling the SSID broadcast for your wireless network. If you have all of your devices already configured and you know what network you're connecting to, there's no need for you to tell everyone, this is my SSID, come join it, or come attack it, or whatever. Um, also, the NOMAP. How many of you have heard of NOMAP? Two or three people. Okay. Apple, Google, and Wiggle don't map your device if you add that to the end of your SSID. Um, Apple and Google and Wiggle through a lot of different things. Use your wireless network for a lot of things and they map where your wireless network is. How many of you knew that? How many of you have a smartphone with wireless turned on right now? How many of you know that they're using that to track you more accurately than GPS? Just a couple of you, right? They actually use the names of your wireless networks and the positions of those to determine where you are and it's more accurate than a satellite pinpointing you through GPS. And it's faster, yes. So we have Google Fiber at our house. So if putting that no map on there, is that going to stop Google from? <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so the, the the question is, does that stop Google from what? From being able to map our, our wireless device. Uh, absolutely. Oh. And the reason why is because the Google Fiber is a separate thing from your wireless. Uh, it, it should be noted that. For, this for the purposes of this talk, I'm just talking about the wireless part of your connection. So typically when you have an internet connection coming into your house, it plugs into some kind of router, which may or may not be integrated directly with your wireless, and you have like a WAN connection that goes out to the internet, and a LAN connection that provides wireless a as an access point to the rest of your devices in your home. Uh, the thing that I'm talking about specifically here is when Google drives around in their car with their little wireless thing that they've been, you know, berated legally around the world, uh, both here in the United States and across Europe for privacy related things, they're scanning your network. And they've done one better by saying, well, let's sell all of these Android phones to everyone, which is the most popular operating system for mobile phones in the world, and have everyone else do the scanning for us. And we'll just accumulate all this into a database and we'll use it to give you information on where you are. And it's way more accurate than GPS and you'll love it, right? If you add this no map to the end of that, you tell Google, don't map my network. Uh, I do this to my network. You add it to the end of your 
SSID number? To the end of your SSID. So the name of your home network. So when you are scanning to connect to your network through the little wireless thing, if you're on a Mac, you click on the little wireless thing and it lists all the network that you can connect to. If you see the underscore no map, those are the ones that have this kind of thing. And you, it's just text, yes? Do they need the SSID to map it? If you turn it off completely, is that kind of like no map, or do you have to turn it on to tell it not to map it? Uh, the hard part about that is I don't know how to answer that question without saying I can't tell you for sure because Google doesn't follow any rules other than what they've set up for themselves. And the way that they set it up for themselves is to say if you add underscore no map to the end of it, then we won't map it. But there's nothing to say that they wouldn't go ahead and map that anyway. The, the SSID for your network, even if you turn off SSID broadcast, is still there. Yes? Oh, okay. Where do you go to add that? Like, what is the, I guess, the file name? Like, how do you get to that? So, so yeah, it, I, don't, I can't speak for all the different settings in every single router to this room, but uh, the manufacturer for your router should be able to help you with that. Maybe your router came with some documentation or you can look it up online. Um, They're almost always labeled like SSID. Or field. Yeah, either network name or SSID. It'll probably pop up in the first screen or in configuration. Uh, I'm sure that you can Google it for your particular model number, and it would be really easy to find that out. So uh, search for it. Try and try and figure it out. I had a question over here. Oh, you answered you answered my question. Where if you don't broadcast your SSID, are you immune to this? Uh, I would say no, but I can't guarantee that. I don't know how Google operates internally because I don't actually work for Google, and even if I did, I probably couldn't say. <laughs> yeah, it, so adding the no map, regardless of whether you're broadcasting your SSID or not, adding the no map, if they get there, they see that particular thing, and they don't include that in their statistics. Uh, I guess we're picking a little bit on Google because Google is really big and they drive the cars around, but Apple does the same thing. So if you have an iPhone, you're doing that to everyone that you visit their house. If you have the location services turned on and you have wireless turned on. Uh, even when you're not actually connecting to the network, in fact. Oh, and one more thing. Uh, the FBI surveillance van. How many of you have seen that network? I guess that got on like Pinterest or Twitter or something, and a million people have that now. That's actually on the, I think, top 10 or top 15 for the Wiggle network list. So not a great name. Yes? So I just had a question. You talked about disabling the broadcast. Um, my understanding is even if you disable it, there's tons of freeware that can still pull it up and find it on through the air. Is there really any security benefit to disabling it then? Or? You're more secure than your neighbor? Yeah. So the, the answer is yes, but I wouldn't say that that's a great way to secure your network. So is it more secure than broadcasting your SSID? Yes, but only because it's one more step. Someone has to get that software and figure out what your network SSID is. Uh, is it very hard? No. Does it take maybe another minute? Possibly. And if that other minute says attack the neighbor's house instead of yours, is it worth it? I would say yes. Uh, would I spend a lot of time on doing that? No, but it is just to click the button when you're in there changing the SSID, so it's probably worth it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, if you're not broadcasting your SSID, then your wife calls you at work and says, what's our SSID? Because I have my friends over. I want to get on the Wi-Fi. Uh, absolutely. So b by all means, make the decision that's right for you. Obviously, there are, there are conditions where you do or do not want to do that. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what you need to do in your home. You should make that decision for yourself. I'm trying to give you the information about how to use it. Uh, passwords. Uh, brute force is probably the most common way to access someone's network. And the longer your password is, the longer it takes to brute force. How many of you have a password for your home network that is eight characters or less? How about 12 characters or less? How about 20 characters or less? How many of you have one that's longer than 50 characters? <laughs> okay. Uh, Maybe that's a little bit overkill, but choosing a good password is really important. And dictionary attacks are very effective. Most people use dictionary words for their passwords. Uh, some of these things can be limited by device support. Uh, one of the things that we discovered in one of the pre-con challenges for uh, SaintCon is that when you add a new line to a password and you MD5 it, 
it's really hard to look that up in hash tables because people don't think of using those for passwords. If you can add a new line to your password, that's a great character for a password. Backspace. Or backspace, yeah, or spaces. Uh, we're going to thank Adobe for releasing this list of passwords. Um, these are all terrible passwords, as you can tell, by almost 2 million people had the password 123456. Now, I understand that a lot of these things are throwaway accounts, and if you haven't used 123456 for a throwaway account, you haven't lived, I've done it, it doesn't matter, I don't care if someone logs into the stupid account, but the point is that we as humans are terrible at choosing passwords. We tend to choose things that we think are so clever and they're not. Uh, we've got things like Photoshop. Well, I would guess that Photoshop's probably pretty common for people who are using Adobe. Uh, and, and maybe they're all employees, I don't know. I, uh, I gave this talk at Bluehost and I said, anyone who has the name Bluehost in your password, you're doing it wrong, right? That's not the way that it works. Um, if you use the, the service that you're using for, like Adobe123, as your password, you're not being very clever. Uh, how many of you have seen XKCD, choosing a good password? How many of you use correct horse battery staple as a password? <laughs> Nobody, really? I think that's a great idea. Anyway, maybe it's not a great idea now that it's on here, and maybe you guys can hack all my passwords or something, but the idea is using these things with spaces in between is a great idea. The more random they are, the better. In fact, if you use your kids to spit out random words, that might be better. <laughs> kids are generally more random than adults. Uh, they haven't learned to be not random anymore. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about anonymous networks. How many of you have, excuse me, how many of you have used Tor? Okay. If you haven't, you should come to my privacy talk in this room after lunch. Um, how many of you used Comcast? No choice. <laughs> no choice, right? How many of you knew that the new wireless access points that Comcast is shipping with part of their rentals allows people to log in with their Comcast credentials on your connection and allows you to log into their connection somewhere else? And it's enabled by default. Yeah. And it's enabled by default. Uh, I would suggest that Comcast is like the coolest <laughs> anonymous network in the world because of that feature alone. If I steal your credentials, I can go to any network in the world that has Comcast hooked up and pretend to be you and have no consequences at all. It's absolutely anonymous. Uh, if you have the opportunity, please turn that off. Uh, next I want to talk a little bit about automatically connecting. Home is where the Wi-Fi connects automatically. How many of you connect automatically to Wi-Fi at your house? If you're not raising your hand, you are a liar. <laughs> right? You, you automatically set that up. You type in your password and your computer remembers it. Is that a good idea? No. I don't know. I mean, the, the, the answer is kind of. It's really convenient, but it's terribly insecure. And we're going to talk about why that is. So the Wireless Network Association happens in this particular manner. You probe, your computer sends out a probe request for an SSID. It says, I'm looking for this network. So I'm looking for FBI surveillance van. And your wireless access point says, I am FBI surveillance van. And you say, OK, FBI surveillance van, here is my WPA2 pass key. And it says, OK, well, here's the authentication response. And then you have encrypted traffic after that. In a generalized sense, right? We're kind of compressing it down. So what's the problem here? It's Someone can say, yes, I'm your network. Yeah, it's right here, the identification response. That's where the problem happens. So we're going to talk a little bit about namespace collisions. How many people in this room are named David? Two, okay, how about Dan? One, really, oh, I must have chosen terrible names. Mike? Two, Emily? All right. <laughs> so I, I do this, John? And two? All right, so let's say I want to talk to this John over here. And I say, hey, John, are you there? What's preventing him from saying, hey, I'm John? Nothing, right? So if your wireless network is named FBI Surveillance Van and someone else says, hey, I'm FBI Surveillance Van, what's preventing you from connecting to that? 
absolutely nothing, unfortunately. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're running Linux or Windows or Mac or some homegrown thing that you probably built yourself. Chances are it does not do anything to make sure that you're connecting to the right thing. <clears throat> so the problem here is your, your association answer is in the request. I'm looking for John, and it doesn't matter which John responds, I'm just looking for John. Uh, there's really an issue with identity validation, um, and you have the BSSID and MAC dependency, which could be helpful in this regard, but the radio wave nature is that I don't know that I'm plugging into this port on this particular thing. I'm sending out radio waves, and radio waves are coming back. If I expect my access point to be over here, and the access point over here responds, how do I know that it was over there? How many of you have ever th thought about that? No, nobody thinks about that, right? You're like, I'm just connecting to the wireless network. That's what I'm doing. Uh, and you have access point limitations where things can uh, be affected. For example, if John over here wants to replace the John over here, and he wants to be the John over there instead of me connecting to that John, so I connect to that John. How does he do that? Just DDoS this guy, right? If he DDoSes that access point and keeps himself up, which John am I going to connect to? Well, there's only one John now. It's not even a competition. Thanks, John. All right. So, how many of you have heard of the Wi Fi pineapple? Oh, good. We're going to have a great demo here in just a minute. Um, the Wi Fi pineapple is a device that does just this. It's pre-configured hardware and software. You can get it for about $100 online. Uh, it uses this thing called Karma, which uh, Karma attacks radio machines automatically. It's also called, anyone know German? Yes, man. Yes, man? That's German for you. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce it, so sorry. Um, it's a plug and play association exploit. You, turn, you plug it in, you turn it on, you turn on the association exploit, and you're grabbing connections, you're man in the middle. You have become John. Uh, it has USB expansion, it's open source. You can actually get it for alternate hardware as little as 30 USD, which is really cheap, although technically that hardware is not legal in the United States of America because I guess it allows you to do up to channel 14 on 2.4 gigahertz, which I don't think is okay. Yeah, so uh, anyway, uh, we're gonna do a demo of that in just a minute. But uh, essentially, it has a couple of interesting features that are terribly important. You have replacement and redirection. Pineapple comes with DNS spoof. How bad would it be if someone replaced the DNS for Google and pretended to be Google? Well, probably not so great, right? Maybe you're not searching for something terribly important, but uh, how about if they replace the DNS for your VPN or your corporate website? Could they get interesting things from that? I would imagine so. Uh, they can return spoof pages in a format like Etsy hosts. How many of you use Etsy hosts? Yeah. Pretty easy to use, right? Yeah, sure. Put an IP address, you put a name, you're done. Uh, decryption, it also comes with SSL strip and attempts to defeat SSL encryption. Uh, there are ways that modern browsers kind of help you to not fall victim to this, but it's still interesting that you know, that kind of vulnerability is there. And then there are custom scalable modules. The Pineapple allows for a bunch of different modules that you can install. You can download from their little app store and hack away. And you can also build your own custom modules. Uh, and then Pineapple can also be configured with Aircrack NG. How many of you used Aircrack? Okay, maybe you're not hackers, but it's fun. Um, it decrypts WEP and WPA with dictionary attacks. It decrypts packets with known keys. Uh, injects and sniffs packets. Uh, it can also mess with the ESSID stuff and it can facilitate the deauth attack where we, we DDoS this person, deauth the people and move them over to another network. Um, how many of you would like to see this device in action? Great. How many of you knew that I was uh, going to do this and turned off your device in advance? <laughs> if you didn't, I'm sorry, you're way too late. All right. <clears throat> All right, let's see if we can connect here.
All right. Okay, is that big enough? Can everyone see it? So here I am logged into the Wi-Fi Pineapple. And um, there's a couple of great things. So auto SSH. Uh, one of the things that you generally would like to do if you're controlling a, a device of this nature is to be able to access it remotely. Uh, one of the things that's a challenge for that is uh, NAT. How many of you know what NAT is? Anyone want to explain it for us? It allows <laughs> internal networks to use their own IP address and then filter and then route all of that traffic through like one IP address that's on the internet. Right, essentially you have two interfaces. You have a WAN interface and a LAN interface. And all of the things on the LAN only go out through one specific IP. And one of the things that's great about NAT is it blocks a lot of incoming traffic so that people can't just hack all of your machines individually. They hack your router instead. And then they get to your machines. Um, <clears throat> but if you're trying to plug this device in, say, at a coffee shop or at... Open West, and you want to connect to it remotely, uh, connecting inbound to a particular device that's on a private IP space is kind of impossible. So you use auto SSH to take an SSH tunnel and go out instead of wait for something to come in. Uh, you can set it up to auto start, and then um, you've got the pineapple bar that gives you updates. Where's my mouse? There it is. Whoa, that's really small. Goodness. All right, let's try this again. Okay. Um, so here's where you can turn on DNS spoof. And DNS spoof allows you to spoof things like Google is actually at my IP address instead of the real Google IP address. Um, and then you can update the firmware. But the really interesting thing here is Karma. And we're going to take a look at Karma. Come on. Maybe I should click harder. Yeah, you don't click hard enough. So. You gotta click, click more. Click it ten times. Actually. I've had that same problem with that web UI. Make it go back down to normal size. Uh -huh. Maybe I do have bad karma. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, so let's take a look at the log. You guys probably can't even read that, can you? Maybe a little bit smaller, or maybe we should just make it bigger. There we go. How many of you can read that now? All right, so here we go. See all these probe requests? Bunch of people looking for Open West guest, and a bunch of people looking for Wolverine Wi-Fi. That's not terribly interesting. But uh, yeah, applesauce. So probably someone in this room, if you have a home network called applesauce, you're connected to me right now. And you didn't know it, right? There's no way for you to possibly know that. Um, everywhere that it says that um, you have the successful association, uh, it connected. Yes? So if uh, him connecting with Applesauce, didn't he send out the key as well? So can you grab that key and connect to that Wi-Fi? So the, the answer to that is no, and that's because of the way that this works in particular. So. When you send out your WPA2 key, you don't send it plain text. Thank goodness, right? You don't want to send it plain text. So you don't get the plain text key on the other side. And essentially, what the Wi-Fi pineapple does is say, thanks, you did a great job sending me the correct key, and just connects you anyway. Anyway, um, I've had this on for a couple of minutes. And... You can see all of those probe requests. Let's just look at the associations. That's probably more interesting. <coughs> oh, 
All right, so all of these people, we've got Centrelink, local uh, internet provider, right? Somebody has an address that starts with 3990. Uh, C4 Corp, Uber 5G, Pixel, Celeritas 314, probably another address. Vivint, Home Wireless. Um, Linksys Info, Collins Wireless, Hogsworth Star, I mean, all kinds of stuff on here. <laughs> Colin, are you in here? Colin collision in here? We might have a Colin collision in here. Anyway, so, and uh, one of the, the nice things about the Wi-Fi Pineapple is that uh, it allows you to blacklist certain things, so we shouldn't be attacking the, the Wolverine Wi-Fi. Um, so they, they should not show up here. So if you're connected to the Wolverine Wi-Fi, good for you. Um, one of the interesting things about this particular mechanism is that it also allows for uh, hijacking connections that you're already connected to. If you're already connected to something and I respond faster to your probe request than the other device does, you'll connect to me and not even know it. Um, anyway, so that's Karma. Let's get back to the slides. If I can figure out how to... On full screen, that. Yes? What are the legal ramifications of that? Is that technically, uh, is that technically uh, wiretapping? Would that fall under wiretapping laws? So the answer to that is it's tricky. And. It's great. Can I help you there, Seth? Yeah. It's, it is a gray area, but ultimately, you sent out a request and he answered it and you connect it, so it's, there, there's no legal, you, you can't come up here and, and file a lawsuit against him, but most certainly it's not ethical. Right, yeah. and what about if someone's using uh, VoIP and they decide to call 911, and that doesn't go through for some reason, it, could there be any? There's, 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 there's probably most line. certainly a legal hair to split there. Yeah, so there's not a great deal of legal precedence on this kind of thing, and the reason why is because you have a bunch of people who are judges and legislators who don't do this kind of thing, and they don't know how to do it, how to solve this problem. Uh, I'm not trying to do this to, to seal your connection, and I'm not trying to do this as a man in the middle, although I wore the little badge thing. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not doing this as a malicious thing. I'm trying to tell you that people can buy this for $100 and can do this to you without you knowing. Yeah. So uh, the answer is, is it an ethical quandary? I think absolutely. Uh, should you do it for nefarious purposes? Absolutely not, which is why I have my disclaimer at the beginning. Uh, could you do it for nefarious purposes? Yes. Are people doing this for nefarious purposes? Yes. Uh, has anyone been put in jail or charged with some kind of uh, wire fraud, not to my knowledge, but I mean, if, if you choose to do this, you're kind of on your own. Yes? Usually what people get thrown in jail for is fraud. The act that they're doing while sniffing is illegal. The sniffing itself is the gray area. Sure, and... You'll get credit card fraud, you'll get theft, identity theft, things like that that are hard and fast laws that you will get thrown in jail for. Right, so for sure don't do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, don't steal someone's credit card number, but uh, it is important to understand how, I, I think it is important to understand how the technology works so that you don't lose your credit card numbers. Yes? Could you, in a way, do this for a lot cheaper just by getting a Wi-Fi dongle, sticking it into your computer, and like creating your computer as a virtual router, and then just accepting signals that are... You, you absolutely can. Uh, the, the challenge there is getting your computer to turn into an access point because most of the Wi-Fi dongles that you get are client dongles. They don't send out broadcasts to everyone and they're not, the hardware isn't designed to do that. Uh, in the case of the Wi-Fi pineapple, let me pull it out here and show it. <coughs> By ear running Linux, you could do it with your laptop. The nice thing about pineapple is, is there for you. Right? So this is the Wi-Fi pineapple and it's connected to a battery supply that you can also buy with the kit. Um, it's got a pretty big antenna on one side. You can get bigger antennas. 
the device is only this big. It has two antennas because one side is for the access point and one side is for the client so that it can connect to another network and you can get complete pass through. Uh, the previous versions of the Wi-Fi Pineapple didn't have that. And to be able to do the pass through, you'd actually have to do this very thing where you would have the Wi-Fi Pineapple act as an access point and then you would connect a network cable to it and tunnel it through your computer. Uh, let me tell you that's not the best idea because then everything is on your network. So when I was explaining it to my brother at home and I plugged it in and I turned it on, within minutes all of my neighbors connected to my network. <laughs> right? Uh, so be careful with the experiments you're doing with this too. <laughs> a any other questions? Yes? I was just going to say one way to know that someone's got one of these is in, at least on Macs in your Wi-Fi access point list you'll see every access point you ever connected to in that list. Okay. That, that might be true depending on how the, the device itself is set up. Uh, also, uh, when I ran this test at Bluehost, we had some people connecting to the Marriott Hotel while they were at my presentation. I don't know if you know this, but there isn't a Marriott Hotel at the Bluehost campus. So that's a pretty good sign. Uh, but once again, to be able to do that, you actually have to look. You have to look at the pull down and see what networks are available. Did I just connect to the Marriott Hotel and I'm not in the Marriott Hotel? That's a problem. Or did I just connect to my home network and I'm at the beach? Uh, any of those things should be red flags, but you have to actually look. Uh, other things that you can do for kind of wireless domination. Uh, the Raspberry Pi, I think they just released a new one. It's like $36. Um, you can install the Pwn Pi distribution, and uh, it includes 135 pen testing utilities, including Raver, Reaver, Aircrack, DHP, CP Dump, Kismet, MDK3, Nmap, SSLs, Scan, Sniff, and Strip. Uh, all of those things are pretty easy to install, but it's way easier when you just dump it on an SD card and it automatically works. So yes, you can set up your own computer to be one of these kinds of things, but for 35 bucks, it's hard to beat. Uh, the, on the flip side, the Raspberry Pi doesn't come with wireless out of the box, so you'd have to add some kind of functionality to that. Um, and I didn't actually bring the Raspberry Pi today. So we talked a little bit about remote control. Uh, connecting through firewalls and that is hard, but connecting out and then connecting to that is really easy. So essentially what you do is you take your device and your SSH tunnel to a VPS outside of two firewalls and use the connection there to continue to issue commands to your device. Uh, this is useful for attackers who would like to attack your company or your home network because they can take the little battery pack and stick this somewhere like a coffee shop or your company or even plug it into the wall or put it in some power supply which some people have done and they can sniff your traffic and send it back out very easily using this particular method. Uh, this is probably why a lot of institutions don't allow SSH tunnels back out. Uh, which is really hard if you're using SSH for your business. Yes? So a good idea then is to, to add, a pri add, a, uh, add something that says I'm getting hacked as your primary attempt and your secondary as your home if you want to do automatic. Because you'll always go to that one first. Sure. Uh, that, that's a great method to do. If you're watching. Uh, and Honestly, it would be uh, really helpful if your computer respected your network priority list. Uh, I don't know how many of you have issues with that, but I run a Mac here, and at work, I almost always get the one that I didn't choose first. Right? It's a problem. Yes? Let me add something. One of the things that we're releasing in the next month or so on the Utah St. GitHub, I, I see your nice shirt there. Thank you. Um, is a little utility. It's only written for Mac right now. It'll probably easily port to Linux and some other things that will that will de-auth de you from an SSID if the, the Mac addresses don't match. And so you can now set it up so that when you hop on a, a, a wireless access point, not only are you going to authenticate the SSID, but you're also going to make sure that the MAC address that you're talking to is the one that you would expect to, and if both don't match, then, you, then it kills the connection for you. Which, which is a great idea, obviously. We talked about how the SSID is really important as far as you actually connect to a MAC address and not to the SSID. You use the SSID to initialize the connection, uh, and so using the SSID to say, I'm not just connecting to this thing, 
I'm connecting to the thing with this name, but I'm also connecting to the thing with this name that matches this hex string. That's great. The only problem is that attackers, if they're going by, can realize what your SSID is and just duplicate it. There's a functionality on here for you to be able to set the MAC address that you're broadcasting. Is that your question? Yeah, that was my question. Yeah. So, uh, and, and the, if they know what your MAC address is at home, then they can get through it. But it's a, it's a good thing to defeat. Just the casual... Right, so the, the answer to that is, uh, obviously, being perfectly secure is really hard. But doing some of the basics of understanding this is what an SSID is, this is what a BSSID is, and making sure that the two of them match, uh, it's kind of like turning off your SSID broadcast. Will it stop everyone? No. But adding that as another layer as part of your security, I think, is a good idea. Yes? If your attacker knows your... Uh home MAC address, then you have other problems to worry about. <laughs> and Absolutely, right? Um, uh, obviously, it's not hard to get a MAC address if you're sniffing packets over the air. I mean, the way that wireless works, all the packets for every computer that's open, that's transmitting on wireless right now, I can grab or you can grab. It's just in the air. There's nothing that says only you can get those packets. Uh, just your computer generally only respects that. But, uh, you know, if someone is actively attacking your network, they can do things like get your SSID and get your BSSID and use those things to set up this kind of thing. Uh, if you've made someone angry enough to attack your home network with one of these kinds of things and that kind of sophistication, I don't know that there's much that I can do to help you other than say, good luck. <laughs> All right, so um, as far as safety is concerned, uh, you should use the best safety features available. WPA2 is the industry standard for encryption on networks. You should use that. You should choose a great password. I would recommend turning off your SSID broadcast if you can. If you have a wife at home who won't let you, then obviously don't. Um, <laughs> MAC address filtering, turning that on for, for your home network and only allowing devices to connect to your network that you have allowed is a great idea. Although once again, it's one of those things where it's just another layer of security. It's not gonna stop someone because they can uh, forge MAC addresses. Uh, I would say get rid of default configurations, passwords, and names wherever possible, and be observant. Investigate the changes. If you notice that you're connecting to something that you shouldn't be at a particular time, then disconnect or don't run any kind of traffic on there that you expect to be secure because it probably isn't. Uh, as far as mitigation strategies, one of the things that Troy and I have talked about a lot is in addition to paying attention, Honeypot these SSID networks. Uh, we talked about like putting up a bogus network. Uh, I'm going to connect to this fake network, and if anything ever responds to that, that's a red flag, right? Uh, make sure you have a verified BSSID list, which is what Troy's talking about as far as that thing. And then using GPS and wiggle detection, if you can determine that the network that you're trying to connect to shouldn't exist in the GPS location where you are in the world, then you shouldn't connect to it. And that's kind of sophisticated. Uh, I'd love to add that to our little thing here when, when I get the chance. Um, so if anyone is willing to help out in, in coding that, that'd be great. You can come talk to me and we'll get it worked out. Uh, other wireless devices. How many of you use cellular phones? If you're not raising your hand, you're probably a liar. Uh, RFID, the little badges that you probably use to get into work. Uh, Bluetooth, I'm using a Bluetooth keyboard here. Uh, health monitoring devices or media devices, motorway passes, the little freeway pass. How many of you have that? Radio all the way. Uh, all of those things are vulnerable to the same kinds of attacks that we're talking about today. Uh, additionally, there's a thing called software-defined radio. Uh, it can access anything in the bands that are permitted by the hardware, even if it's illegal. The software determines how the radio works, and it can access nearly all usable frequencies. Uh, you can get some for as little as $8. Uh, it takes a bit of setup, though. You'll have to read up on that to be able to do that. There are some great talks out there. Uh, you can search on YouTube to understand a little bit more about software-defined radio. But there's some really cool research being done on that. Uh, a lot of dangerous things with uh, aircraft and hospital devices and things like that. We're going to be t talking a lot about it at the same time this year. Yes. Um, if you're what's really it? interested, you might want to come there. And uh, in the meantime, I think Balint Spear is his name, the guy who gave a talk at DEF CON about that. Fascinating talk. You should totally watch it. Uh, 
that's all that I have for this presentation. If you have any questions, I will do my best to field them. And thank you. Yes.